This lockdown is playing havoc with my sex life. I'm actually beginning to think I'd be better off in a relationship, which would be a first for me. Except, of course, then we'd have to be living together to form our bubble, and frankly, living with a girl really isn't my style. Well, to be perfectly honest, any relationship that lasts longer than a few hours isn't my style. I usually meet girls on a variety of dating apps, and almost always we, well, consummate our relationship on the first date, if you can call it a relationship. I always suggest meeting at a local watering hole, and after the preliminaries are over, I suggest a nightcap back in my place, which is conveniently just around the corner. I share a two-bedroom flat with an Australian guy, Craig. He always jokes that I bring a different girl back home every night. Which is an exaggeration. It's rarely more than five nights a week. He's envious, of course. Anyways, if a girl does end up coming back here, then I know she's fair game. Put it this way, we both know exactly what's going to happen. Now, from time to time, I do meet a girl that doesn't want to come back here on the first date. Takes all sorts. But, if I think she's worth it, then I suggest a second date, which invariably ends up with yours truly cooking her a meal. I ask Craig to keep out of the way for a couple of hours. I've had to become quite adept in the kitchen, actually. Of course, I create a nice romantic mood, you know. Low lights, appropriate music, sometimes even candles. And once dinner is over, then we move over to this sofa and, uh, well, one thing tends to lead to another. Some of them do need a degree of uh, persuasion. It's like a military exercise. It's a case of making a move, what I think of as a sortie. And then pulling back whenever I meet some resistance and then slowly building up to another sortie and so on until eventually she gives in. Persistence always pays off in the end. And for most girls, any reluctance at first is just for show. So they don't come across as easy, which in this day and age is a bit daft if you ask me. But whether it's genuine or not, I'm always determined to overcome their resistance. After all, aren't persistence and determination generally regarded to be good qualities? At least in a man. In a woman, they can come across as bloody-minded and strident. But I don't think I've ever pushed you hard. Put it this way. I've never had any complaints. Now, at the outset, girls often say they want more than just a one-night stand. And of course, I say the same. Well, to be perfectly honest, I would say anything to get what I want. And afterwards, I always tell them that I'll be in touch. But in reality, I always wait for them to call me. You see, if they do, then they're obviously keen. And so at that point, I tell them that I'm not ready for a one-to-one. -one, but if they're interested... Perhaps we could be friends with benefits. In my experience, only about 10% of girls go for it, but that's more than enough, to be frank. I mean, after all, there are only so many hours in a day. <laughs> Although friends with benefits doesn't exactly describe the situation now, does it? I mean, we're not friends. I don't do female friends. I choose my friends based on... Interests that we have in common. The two interests in particular, fast cars and sport, especially rugby. Now, some girls pretend that they like cars, but I don't think they do. Not really. If I ever ask their opinion about a car that I've seen in a magazine or on the street, all they can ever mention is the colour. And when I meet with my uh, rugby mates or the petrol heads, it's an unspoken rule that none of us show up with a girl in tow. It would just cramp our style. We wouldn't be able to talk about the same things now, would we? Not cars, not rugby, definitely not girls. 
And I'm sure that girls talk about us all the time when they get together. And they probably talk about very little else. Or maybe shopping and hair product. Look, the truth is, there's only one thing I want from a girl. And don't get me wrong, I respect women. I really do. I just think that they have their agendas and we have ours. And women like me. They like how they have my complete attention whenever we get together. I mean, you have to seem interested, don't you? It's all part of the game. And if I'm perfectly honest, it is like a game to me. A game which one way or another, I usually win. But this lockdown has put a stop to all of that. It's a disaster. I honestly feel like I've been castrated. At the start of lockdown, I was still swiping right a few times a day, even though there was no chance of hooking up. Frankly, it had become a, a bit of a habit, but it's good for the ego to get plenty of matches. At least when this lockdown ends, I can hit the ground running. Now, one of these girls, Lauren, suggested we talk using Zoom. The only reason I agreed to it was because I thought cyber sex might be on the cards. It's a poor substitute for the real thing, but it is better than nothing. After all, the visual component is a big deal for most men. For some women as well. Either way, I suppose it's the ultimate form of safe sex. So, I start talking to Lauren and I try to edge the conversation in that direction. But she wasn't keen. Which is a real pity because she's very pneumatic. That's my word for sexually desirable. Oh, she's this curvy, short hair brunette with pale skin and freckles. And she's got these really strong eyebrows that almost meet in the middle. Okay, I realize that that description probably doesn't do her justice, but she is very much my type. It's a pity she's not up for cyber sex. Before the lockdown, I would often take photos of girls in, well, compromising positions, even videos sometimes. I realized that from their perspective, it's a really bad idea. Of course, there's no way that I would show them to anybody or post them online or anything. But obviously, they can't know that for sure. I mean, they really are for my eyes only, or well, to be precise, for another part of my anatomy. So. I see it as a very good thing if the passion of the moment overtakes their common sense. It means that they're more of what you might call a sexual being in comparison to those who have the good sense to refuse. I mean, after all, we're not all equally sexual. In my experience, girls vary a lot from one another. And I'm not making any judgments. I, I just think we all have our different priorities. If some girls like to prioritize their career or perhaps getting in a long-term relationship or so getting married and having babies. And Well, I don't give a fuck about any of those things. <laughs> I don't mind admitting that my number one priority is sex. And I like girls who are the same. But Lauren called me a hedonist. Well, I suppose I am. Look, there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of pleasure. It's the only thing that you can really rely on. Everything else is a preamble. It's a, it's a means to an end. Show me a man who claims to value anything other than his own gratification, and I will show you a liar or a fool. This famous writer got asked on his deathbed if he had any regrets. And he said, yes, not enough sex. Well, I am not going to be in that position. After all, who looks back from the deathbed and wishes they spent more time in the office? I started a law degree but flunked out, so now I'm a broker in the city. And that's like a game as well. I'm buying and selling. You win some, you lose some. Of course, you can't charm stocks and shares, but there is still a big element of persuasion involved. 
I have to persuade my client to trust me to identify those companies that are going to do well. Now, between me and you, they're no worse off just sticking a pin in the business page of the Financial Times. On average, most of us don't do any better than that. But we tell the client a very different story. That's why you don't get many women in my job. I think that basically, women are just too honest, which doesn't get them anywhere in the city. I mean, in order to succeed, you have to be as, as self-interested and aggressive and competitive as we are, which are very unattractive qualities in a woman. Anyways, the job pays the rent, but it's hardly a vocation, so it doesn't deserve any more than the bare minimum of my time and effort. In fact, for most of the day, my mind is on what I'm going to be doing in the evening or on the weekend. I'm planning for it while the boss isn't looking. <laughs> in my experience, the most, the most interesting and rounded people I know have pretty undemanding jobs. Those who focus on their careers, they tend to be as dull as dishwater. They seem to have no interest or knowledge outside the very narrow field of work. And it's even worse for women. I mean, with all the obstacles that they face, if they want to rise through the ranks, they have to dedicate themselves, life and soul, to their careers. And as a consequence, everything else in their lives becomes a very low priority. And work is all they ever talk about. I mean, I've met a few of that type and I always have to make a big effort to stop my eyes glazing over. So when Lauren told me that she's in, that she's a product designer, <laughs> I had to stifle a yawn. But as it turns out, it's not so bad in her case because she sees the world with a, well, with a designer's eye which is actually pretty interesting, well, most of the time. She even knows a thing or two about car design. I mean, if I mentioned to her a car that I'm particularly interested in, she would Google it and then comment on its lines. I mean, she doesn't know anything about what goes on underneath the bonnet, but she does have a lot to say about its design and the development of a particular style. For example, we both love the Porsche 911. And she told me everything there is to know about its design of the earlier models going all the way back to the 1940s. I mean, I was certainly impressed. And it's not even just cars. I mean, if I tell her I want to buy a, a new smartphone or a new laptop or whatever, she would comment on the uh, visual design of all the options. So... Lauren is the rare exception to the rule. A woman with a decent job who's, who's actually pretty interesting to talk to. Although Lauren is not up for cyber sex, I get the feeling that she's actually pretty sexual underneath. I'm definitely looking forward to finding out for certain when this lockdown is finally over. So we talk about other things. It's a unique experience for me. Normally, the main focus of a conversation with a girl is becoming intimate with her at the earliest opportunity, which means having to present myself in a particular way so that I seem to be suitable boyfriend material. So I tend to concentrate on things that a girl is most likely to find interesting. For example, it always seems to go down well if I tell them that I like nothing more than travel and top restaurants. But with Lauren, it's as if I can talk about anything. There's no point pretending to be someone I'm not. I can't keep that up forever and this lockdown could go on for months. So... I feel like I can be completely natural with her. I mean, there's no ulterior motive, no hidden agenda. Well, at least not in the short term, and I don't do long term anyways. I can relax. It's as if I'm with one of my mates. Well, actually, to be perfectly honest, 
the conversation is a good deal more interesting. I mean, it's funny how I get home like a house of fire with my mates in a group, but one to one, it's it's not the same. I mean, we certainly never zoom. I haven't had any contact with them since the beginning of lockdown. Meanwhile, with Lauren, we've been zooming most evenings for the past six weeks now. And our conversation lasts longer than two, three hours, and we never run out of things to talk about. For example, we've been talking about all the things that we're going to do together after lockdown. We're, we're planning a holiday together. We're thinking of hiring out a Porsche and just driving off, maybe to Wales, which in my experience is the best country for good driving roads. She even wants to share the driving. I'm not sure about that. Well, maybe. As long as there's no parallel parking involved, eh? <laughs> Lauren talks a lot about feelings. About how she feels about the lockdown and being stuck in the house with her parents and not being able to see her grandma, who she can't see because she lives in a nursing home and they don't allow visitors. I don't usually do feelings. And guys generally don't. It's not something that ever comes up. Lauren says it's because we're afraid to show our vulnerability. That it's like we're in competition with one another, like we were in the wild. <laughs> I mean, I suppose our banter does tend to be competitive. You know, who's driven fastest, who's scored most tries, uh, most checks. <laughs> Come on, of course we're going to be putting each other down. If anybody was ever to show any vulnerability, they'd be laughed at. I know for a fact that some of my mates have gone through some rough patches, but they never mention anything. At least not to me. Perhaps I'm just not the type of person you use as a shoulder to cry on. Probably wouldn't fancy it anyways. And I'm not saying that I'm unsympathetic, you know, just because I'm in control of my feelings, it doesn't mean that I can't understand other people's. I just, I just wouldn't know what to say. I've certainly never been the type of person that wears his emotions on his sleeve. At least not since I was a kid. But I mean, kids always give vent to all their emotions. That's why they're so fucking tiresome. But for an adult, I've always seen it as somehow self-indulgent to always let everybody know how you're feeling all the time. I don't want to burden other people with my ups and downs. Not that I have ups and downs. I'm solid as a rock. I always have been. <laughs> as a kid, my role model was in TVs and film with the strong, silent type. I'm flappable man of few words. It didn't matter what sort of life-threatening situations they were in, they would never lost their cool. And that's how I wanted to be. Keep calm and carry on. Put a brave face on everything. A stiff upper lip. Stoical. In other words, cool as a cucumber. I can't stand those reality TV programs where somebody always feels the need to burst into tears. It's all orchestrated anyways. And I can't abide sentimentality. It's not even a real emotion. It's mawkish and, and cheap. And when I'm watching a drama, I cannot stand having my feelings manipulated. These people aren't real. Why should I give a fuck about them? But Lauren's just the opposite. Well, she's in touch with her feelings and she tries to encourage me to talk about mine. She wanted to know who I talk to when I'm down. Well, the fact is no one, because I'm never down. But she didn't believe me. So she asked if anything really bad ever happened to me. Well, I suppose the worst thing is Jamie's suicide. He was my closest friend in school, and we used to hang out together all the time. And after we finished school, he decided not to go to uni 
but he found uh, an office job in Swindon. He's in insurance. So, was. He had only been there for six months before he took his own life. He just seemed to have everything to live for. I mean, he was a smart, good-looking guy with a steady job and a flower of his own. He didn't leave a note, so nobody knew why he'd done it. And they started asking me because they thought he was closer to me than anyone else. <laughs> his parents wrote me a letter trying to find out if I knew anything. I didn't know what to say. A couple of weeks before the suicide, I, I visited him up in Swindon and I stayed the night. He didn't seem depressed or anything, just his normal, usual self. He's a lot quieter than most of my other mates. Well, he was. The only thing I can think of is that perhaps after he settled in his little flat and in his steady office job in which he could have easily stayed for the next 50 years, he saw his life stretch ahead of him in Swindon and perhaps he didn't like what he saw. In some ways, it was always a mystery to me. He only ever had one girlfriend the entire time I knew him, and that didn't last long. I asked him about it once, and he just said that none of the girls he ever met interested him in the slightest. But the fact is that he never really put himself out there. I mean, he never used dating apps for starters, or at least not that he told me. And my other mates always make a comment when they see a hot girl. For example, if they're stacked, they would say something like, Oh, you don't get many of those to the pound. Or, oh, I'd like to take that for a test drive. You know, that sort of thing. It's just banter, and I'm no exception. It's not disrespectful. If a girl dresses a certain way, you know they're doing it to get our attention. They want to be complimented, no matter what they say about doing it for themselves. But Jamie, Jamie never joined in. Like, not once. <laughs> Lauren said that perhaps Jamie might have been a queer. <laughs> no way, Jose. I would have known. There's no question about it. Lauren wanted to know if that would have been a problem for me, but I mean, it would have reflected on me, wouldn't it? We hung out together all the time. People would have started asking questions. And Lauren didn't seem to understand why that would have been such a big deal. Well, but it is, isn't it? Look, I know it's not politically correct to say it nowadays, but being called a queer is just about the worst insult you can throw at a teenage boy. In the playground, it's still the most common form of abuse. We had two of them in our year at school. There was something about their manner that just, it just grated on me. When they were together, they were always bitchy and sarcastic. And they couldn't talk about anything without making some sort of gay innuendo. And they always referred to other boys as she. One of them was as camp as Christmas. It was more feminine than most girls. It was a parody of a queer. I don't understand why some of them need to be like that. Well, the other one wasn't so bad. I suppose he wouldn't have known if he hadn't come out. Then Lauren said that perhaps Jamie was like him and that he didn't want to come out because he knew I was homophobic. But I'm not homophobic. I, I, didn't, I didn't bully them or anything. I just avoided them. I suppose the idea of having sex with a man just... Disgust me. Like, ugh. I can't think of anything worse. Lauren wanted to know if I ever said that to Jamie. And actually, come to think of it, it may have come up in conversation last time we met. I remember he said something about 
uh, a gay colleague at work and how it was more common than people think. And he mentioned that a straight man in prison often turned queer. I remember I joked that it was probably not the best thing to talk about when we were sharing a bed together. <laughs> Now she's got me wondering. I mean, Lawrence implying that that Jamie might have been in love with me. Christ, I hope not. Lauren is so alive. She's got this shining intensity I've never seen in anyone before. And she's super smart. Like she, she's not just a doer, she's a, she's a thinker as well. She analyzes everything. She mentioned this Greek guy who said, um, he said, a life not contemplated isn't worth living. And she's just like that. She has to get to the bottom of everything. This is usually only one thing I want to get to the bottom of. My God, do we talk for hours and hours and we never get bored of each other, especially about relationships. At first, I didn't want to tell her about my usual approach to dating, one night stands and all that. But she's got this way of encouraging me to open up about all sorts of things. Things I've never talked about before. Things I've never told anyone. Especially my my fears and, and vulnerabilities. For example, we worked out that I avoid long-term relationships because I think I might get found out. That deep down, I'm afraid that maybe if a girl gets to know me better, then she might just reject me. And how I don't want to put myself in any situation where I might fail somehow. <laughs> I told her how I once heard this old Chinese saying. It was something like, life is like a river, don't swim against the current. And that made sense to me. I always thought that the recipe for happiness was to recognize your strengths and your weaknesses and avoid those situations where your weaknesses might cause you to fail and seek out the situations where your strengths might allow you to succeed. Like sport in my case, especially rugby. I've always been good at sports, ever since school. When Lauren said that our society elevates children's ball games out of all proportion, that being good at kicking a sphere into a net doesn't compare to excelling at anything of importance, like achieving a successful relationship. Ouch! I mean, she's got a point, but... Well, she obviously doesn't know anything about rugby. She thinks that sport and trashy TV are the new opium of the people and that they dumb us down and divert us from engaging in the world around us. They're an escape from reality because I always thought reality was overrated. Mind you though, it is the only place where you can get your leg over. <laughs> anyway, according to Lauren, fear is the strongest human emotion and it holds us back from achieving our true potential. You see, she's got this, this way of probing, of getting to the nub of things. She wasn't at all impressed when I told her about my work. <laughs> she said, I'm just a cog in the vast capitalist machine that puts money in the pockets of those who already have more than enough and does worse than nothing for everyone else. She thinks that if I had a more worthwhile job, I would have more self-esteem and I wouldn't need to get it from sexual conquests and pure old ball games. Her words, not mine. But she might have a point. We talked about other jobs that I could do, like charity fundraising or human rights law. It's worth looking into. <laughs> really talk about anything and everything. I mean, we talk about the right way to live. We talk about regrets. We talk about values. We talk about love. We talk about friendship. 
She encouraged me to set up a Zoom meeting with my mates. They were mostly reluctant at first, but then eventually four of them came around to the idea. And it wasn't a success. It's made me realise our conversations with my mates are so superficial, so formulaic. It's the usual repeated mantras about fast cars, sport and hot girls. It's just variations on a theme. There's nothing new, nothing original, nothing deep. I mean, I would make a comment and I would know exactly how each one of my mates was going to respond. It was like pushing buttons on a vending machine. It was utterly predictable and unchallenging. The conversational equivalent of junk food. It's totally different with Lauren. I mean, it's so weird. We're not even in the same room, but when I talk to her, I feel more alive than I ever have before. It's like, it's like I was just going through the motions up to now. In some ways, I, I feel like I've wasted my life. I mean, I might have been having a good time, but I've ignored all my feelings and I've pushed everyone at arm's length. I've immersed myself in trivia, in material things, in children's pastimes, anything to prevent myself from having to deal with real emotions, real ideas. Well, that's all going to change now. And the first step is deleting all my dating apps and try for a one-to-one -one relationship with Lauren. The lockdown is going to be eased soon and we're going to be allowed to see one more person outside of our household. I can't tell you after three months of Zooming how excited I am for our first physical get-together. And I'm not just talking about sex, which is a first for me. Craig lost his job, so he's going back to Australia as soon as restrictions are lifted. And Lauren is tired of living with the parents, so we, we talked about her moving in here and us forming a bubble. I mean, there's part of me that's really enthusiastic about the idea, but if I'm honest, there's, there's also a level of, um, of trepidation. We're meeting for the first time face-to-face -to -face tomorrow. This should be interesting.